Hi, welcome to the Concepts Analysis Lab, or the CAL as we call it. I'm Andrea Weathington. I'm the Division Chief here in the CAL. And first of all, I want to say how sorry we are that you weren't able to physically visit with us, but we hope that this video will provide the information you would have received had you been able to visit. During this video, I'm going to provide a CAL overview, then we're going to do a short tour of our facilities, and then all of our smart interns and other employees will give you some background information and describe the current projects as well as any support they provide to the CAL. So in addition to this video, we're going to host an hour-long Microsoft Teams meeting and you'll be able to meet all the employees of the CAL and ask them any questions that you may, ha may have. So we look forward to meeting you. So the CAL is located in the Technical Center, which is the R&D arm of the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command, which is a very large command with over a thousand plus civilians and soldiers located all over the globe. So the Tech Center's primary mission areas are small satellites, high energy lasers, hypersonics, small targets for intercept test, high power microwave, radars, optics, and we also um, have a major test range that supports large missile defense tests. The Tech Center established the CAL in 2004 to provide a hands-on environment for our high school and college students as well as our newly hired engineers and scientists. The primary source for our interns is the DOD Smart Scholarship Program. And in addition to that, we also bring in contractors and students from our local university, University of Alabama in Huntsville, to fill in our skill gaps. So under the DOD SMART Scholarship, you will work in the CAL during the summers while you're going to school, and then when you graduate, you'll come work in the CAL for one to two years. So during that time, you'll work on multiple projects across all our different mission areas. And in some cases, our interns figure out what they want to do early on, and they go ahead and transition at the one year mark. For others, they like to stay the full two years so they can explore all the opportunities the CAL has to offer and then at that point we will transition them to their permanent office in the Tech Center. So with that, we'll go ahead and start the tour of our facilities. So as you can see, we're in the CAL work area. Um, it's set up in quads and we have it set up that way so that you can work individually at your workstation or you can turn around and meet in small groups at the tables. We have whiteboards and we also have a smart board. So all this is to promote collaboration while working on projects here in the CAL. This is the CAL classroom. This is where we host our staff meetings, lunch and learns, team meetings, and we periodically host technical courses for the interns in here. As you can see, we have a conference table with teleconferencing capabilities. We also have a large media wall that we use for our presentations. And we have 12 workstations that host software tools such as System Toolkit, SolidWorks, MATLAB, and other software tools that we use for modeling and simulation tasks. Then we have, you'll learn later in the video, that we have a radar simulator, and we also have trajectory analysis workstation in here as well. Hi, I'm Walter Trammell. I've been here at the Army Space and Miss Missile Defense Command for about 31 years. Uh, it was the first place that I interviewed when I got out of college and I took the job here because it felt like home. And there's never been a day since I started here that I don't enjoy getting up of a morning and coming to work. My areas in college uh, were, I have a Bachelor of Science with majors in Math, Physics, Chemistry, and Biology. I also have a 
bachelor's, to, bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering. Hi, this is Walter again. We're over here in the hardware lab to give you a quick walkthrough of everything that we have. Here we have the FPGA workstation where they, they do the lab work and all this stuff. You'll hear more about that later. Here we have some equipment set up, discrete components. Here we have some of the experiments set up that we've been working on. This was the first one that led to the work on the FPGA over there. And we have several other experiments set up around here. We have new lab benches, uh, nice shelves on them, extra equipment, plenty of extra equipment, uh, soldering stations, as many as you can use. Uh, this stuff gets shipped out. This stuff gets shipped out to the warehouse, so don't worry about it. Here we have a storage shelf full of equipment and some other stuff that we don't use right now. We have power supplies, uh, scopes, uh, PNAs. Every, everything that we need is up here. Right here we have a, a Stratasys 3D printer and when we finish the print product out of here we put it in this pressure washer right here and clean it up with a pressure washer and it makes a really nice model when we print something out. Here's another Stratasys printer, um, a new one we just recently got it in. It works very well and the guys will talk to you about that. Here we have the ACES Red satellite that was that's up on the International Space Station. We 3D printed a model of it, actually went over and machined out the parts for this at the Aerophysics Lab, and you'll hear more about that later too. Here's a circuit milling machine. It takes the circuit board and mills out what you want on it, along with your holes to solder parts and stuff into it to, to make whatever you need to make out of it for any, any purpose. Over here, we have two 3D printers, two small 3D printers. We hope you enjoyed our tour of the hardware facility here at the Cal. We really look forward to having you all down and hope you enjoy this as much as we do in here. This is our favorite place to hang out. Take care. So this is the cow clean room area. So in this front part is where we have our small satellite hardware and software in the loop capabilities. Um, Molly will tell you later on in the video about the projects that she's working in this area. Then also in the back we have our ACES Red 1 clean room area. And ACES Red 1 was, it's a small satellite but it's not free flying. It's attached to the International Space Station and it was completely built within the cow and currently um, this area we use we have the flat sat and the engineering development unit in here so when we want to do a software update we go in and um, try it on the flat sat first if it works then we move it over to the engineering development unit if it works there then we go up to the fourth floor up in the payload development lab and send the update to the actual bird that's on the space station so this concludes the tour of our CAL facilities. Our interns also work at other tech center facilities as well to include the aerophysics lab, the payload development lab, the PNT resiliency lab, and our high energy laser lab over on the campus of the University of Alabama in Huntsville. So now you'll get to hear from our current smart interns and other CAL employees about their projects and we hope you enjoy it. So I hope that you're enjoying your virtual tour of the CAL so far. Uh, your next stop's with me, Jordan Dupree. Um, before I get started, I just want to give you a little background uh, about me. Um, I actually started here in the Concepts Analysis Lab, or the CAL, uh, in 2008. I was actually right out of high school. Um, worked here the whole summer as a summer intern and uh, actually probably, I guess, did something right because uh, they actually brought me back to work part-time 
um, while I was in school at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. If you fast forward uh, two years to 2010, uh, I accepted the SMART scholarship um, uh, and again was chosen here uh, at SMDC in the Concepts, Concepts Analysis Lab. Um, fast forward to 2013, I uh, graduated from the University of Alabama in Huntsville uh, with a bachelor's in electrical engineering um, and the rest is history. Um, I've been here ever since and uh, it's been a great place to work so far. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today though is the Concepts Analysis Lab uh, test support group which I am the technical lead for. Uh, what this test support is basically centered around is uh, the Precision Track and Search Radar System. Uh, this system uh, was developed by Technovative Applications in Berea, California and what makes this system uh, such a unique radar is that it is a interferometric radar. And all that means, if you look here at my model that I have on my desk, the receive antennas are uh, separated from each other. Um, and what that does is that allows the radar system to highly, um, to track targets uh, very accurate. Um, and for that reason, it makes it a very, very um, attractive test asset to uh, various testing agencies um, in the Department of Defense. So with this system, uh, we've been supporting various DOD uh, test customers since 2007. Um, in 2013, we, uh, in addition to the radar, uh, we procured two infrared IR cameras uh, to not only provide our test customer with a accurate radar data product, we also then could provide them a visible uh, picture of the target that we are tracking. Uh, the coolest thing about all of this test support though is that all of the software uh, used to operate the radar, to operate the camera, and all of the data analysis tools were developed in-house here in the CAL by members of the CAL. Uh, and in addition to that, um, all of the on-site test support operation of the radar, setting up the radar, and actual on-console operation during a test mission um, is performed by the young uh, professionals here in the CAL. I for one started, uh, the first time I went out to support a test was in 2010. I was just a sophomore at that time at UAH. Um, so uh, it's been a very, very valuable um, opportunity for me because, uh, you know, it, it definitely got me in early on um, in, my, in my government career. Uh, it got me exposed to various uh, DOD radars and the way that the DOD performs testing and also gave me some uh, really valuable hands-on work early in my career. Um, and that's what we kind of utilize this test support um, and the operation in the CAL. Um, that's kind of what we use it for. Um, before I go any further though, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, our biggest test customer that we support. And I have a video that I'm going to show you that will give you an idea of uh, one of the systems that we've been supporting actually since 2007. As soldiers came home from the war in Iraq, they brought home a piece of life-saving equipment with them. That equipment is the Counter Rocket and Mortar Protection System, or CRAM. D Battery 2nd Battalion 6th Air Defense Artillery was certifying instructors on the system last week on Thompson Hill Range Complex. Staff Sergeant Alberto Marcio requested to become a CRAM operator because he credits the system for saving his life while deployed in 2007. I heard some rounds coming in, which is basically I heard some uh, whistling in the air, explosions on the ground, and at first I woke up out of it, I didn't think anything of it until it got louder and closer. And then I heard the Felix weapon system kick off, I heard the alarms go off, I hit the ground, and I started hearing explosions, but not on the ground anymore, but in the air. So I know that weapon system saved my lives and the fellow soldiers on my particular FOB. 6th ADA has been responsible for training and certifying deploying units on CRAM since 2005, but the military has kept the weapon system highly secretive until now. CRAM uses detection, warning, and interception to keep soldiers and equipment at a forward operating base safe from enemy fire. A command crew monitors the situation using radars and then uses a siren to alert soldiers if artillery, rockets, or mortar are coming in. That sensor and warn piece, that, that siren you're hearing and the alert you hear, is even more vital because you'll notice that that alert goes off and that is the four to five seconds soldiers need to seek cover that will save their lives. 
The Navy was the first to use CRAM until wartime efforts in Iraq created a need for the heavy-duty machinery to make its way to land in 2004. Transported on a truck bed, the land-based phalanx weapon system also ensures there is no collateral damage from the two colliding firepowers. This is taken care of by exploding the enemy's ammo in the air. The side effect of this is an impressive light display. It's like shooting a large bullet with a lot of smaller bullets to knock it out of the air. For Marcio, it's not only about his past experience, but future ones that keep him excited about this technology. It's totally amazing product. And uh, I know for my fellow crew members, they love it, especially every time it fires and it destroys the target. They know when we do this in theater, it'll be saving lives. For the Fort Sill Cannoneer, I'm Marie Barbera. A very valuable opportunity uh, for the young professionals here in the lab um, to go out on site, uh, be exposed to all these different uh, tactical systems, and uh, and get a lot of testing experience early on in their career. So, uh, hope you enjoyed that. Um, I am now going to hand it over to Christine Stewart, um, who is the test lead uh, for the test support group, um, and she's going to talk a little bit more about how say someone like you if you came into the lab and wanted to go out um, to a test event, how we would make sure that you were ready to go before you uh, got boots on the ground. Thanks Jordan. As he said, my name's Chris. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of my background. Um, I have a degree in, uh, I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. I'm one of the senior advisors here in the lab which means I have been with the command forever. Um, I think this is my 36th year that I'm just now starting. The past eight years I've been here in the Cal Lab, and my function here is as the test, uh, the Cal test lead. Um, throughout my career, I have done data analysis, simulation work, data collection and analysis, algorithm development. I actually managed two large radar ships, but when it came down to actually operating the radar, I had never done that until I got here to the Cal. And actually, bless his heart, Jordan <laughs> was given the responsibility to help teach me how to operate the PTS radar, as well as do the data analysis reduction efforts that go with that. And so I came in at ground zero. Um, as, as the years have gone by, I've, I've, I've learned a lot, Jordan's been a wonderful teacher, but we decided we needed to do something a little bit different for folks coming in to make a better use of their time on the range. And that is one thing that you'll get to do. Every intern has the opportunity to go out in the field to do real world testing and operate the radars. Um, we actually have brought in this year to the lab a simulator that shows exactly what you'll see out in the field. Uh, this is an example of what we have. When we bring you in, we'll give you a course. The course is currently in development. We should be few, uh, done in the next few weeks, but we'll walk you through every aspect of what we do when we go to the field. You'll get a lot of in, uh, information on things you'll probably never have to do, such as positioning the radar, but the information's there if you ever do need it. We'll walk you through running the radar system itself, why we do some of the things we do, and also a brief introduction to how to perform the data analysis that Jordan mentioned that we turn in at the end of every day. The wonderful thing about the CAL is you get to explore different career uh, options, different areas of engineering. For example, we had one person come in, their degree was in biomed engineering. First time they went out to Yuma for a field test, they absolutely fell in love with the place. They loved the testing, they loved the radar work, so when they left the Cal and moved up to the project office, it changed their entire career course. They, they decided radar was the field for them, and that's what they've been doing ever since. So that is a wonderful thing about being here in the Cal. Some people love field testing, some it's not for them. 
that's another advantage that the simulator we've brought in has. Not only does it teach you how to operate the radar, but it also serves as a test bed uh, for some of our folks whose main focus is software development, uh, putting in software patches, changing how the interface looks. They can do that here in Huntsville without having to go into the field to implement it and work on the development. I think Yuma has been a really fun place to work. Uh, it's not your typical office environment out there. We uh, have a very small dedicated team that goes out. All the people out there, you have a good time. You work hard, you work weird hours. The good thing is our radar technician is a wonderful chef. We eat really well out there. And uh, it's a good group of people to work around. So I hope you've enjoyed this section of the uh, briefings, and we can't wait to see you. Hello, and congratulations for uh, receiving the Smart Scholarship Award. I know it's a tremendous achievement, and I know for me personally, it freed up a lot of mental real estate, not having to worry about financial worries uh, throughout my college career. My name is Ricky Acosta, and a little bit of background about me. Uh, I went to Georgia Tech for electrical engineering, and I am currently um, about almost at the tail end of my two-year commitment here at uh, the Concepts Analysis Lab for uh, SMDC in Huntsville. So um, kind of on freeing up a lot of mental real estate uh, with paying tuition that the Smart Scholarship does, that allowed me to explore a lot of my degree and to uh, focus on what I'm really interested with electrical engineering. And with here at the Concepts Analysis Lab, the learning never ends. And what I found was that all of the projects that we do here, while they support the bigger picture of SNDC and Army as a whole, it also enables me to tie in a lot of disciplines within electrical engineering into one cohesive project. And we have here a pretty representative uh, picture of our day-to-day -day working at the lab here. And um, I'll introduce Connor, I'll have Connor introduce himself and kind of talk about some of the hardware and software that we work on at the Cal. Hi, uh, so I'm Connor, uh, Connor Mackey. I just graduated last year from the University of Michigan. I actually got both uh, the last two years of my bachelor's and my master's covered through the SMART program. Um, and I can tell you it did change my life when I was in school, absolutely. Uh, not having to worry about finances, uh, having a job, you know, balancing all of that was a huge weight lifted off of my chest and that really helped me to be able to focus on my studies and get through school. Um, and then, like Ricky said, when you come to the lab here, uh, the learning really doesn't stop. And uh, I actually find that some of the projects we get to work on here end up being even more beneficial than certain classes to me because it sort of combines cohesively uh, several different aspects of your engineering degrees. So I know a lot of you, maybe in undergrad, in grad school you probably specified, but um, in undergrad for me, I, you know, I understood a lot about very random, seemingly disconnected topics in engineering, um, and I, I didn't really know how to cohesively combine those. Uh, here, when you work in the lab, everything we do is a combination of different fields. So, you know, you're working a lot with mechanical mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers. I'm personally an electrical engineer uh, specifying in hardware design, but then you get to work a lot with software as well, and then all aspects of electrical engineering. So, you know, for example, we, we work on various projects with uh, radio frequency, so we have to understand uh, E&M waves, then we have to understand sampling, signal processing, um, and then how do you do this signal processing on hardware, so then you have to understand, you know, FPGA development, uh, circuit design, things like that. So it's, it really does span the whole spectrum of, of work, which I think is a, is a huge benefit to working here. So I actually have a little bit of examples. Obviously, you know, we work on too much stuff to show you everything we do, but there are some examples that I would like to show you guys. So you'll see uh, on these screens, these four here, the top left, uh, these are some test signals. And what this means is before we design a system to actually operate in, you know, in real time or, or on an actual uh, you know, setup, we simulate a lot of these test inputs beforehand in MATLAB. So, you know, you probably use MATLAB right now in your classes, uh, but I can promise you that MATLAB doesn't ever go away. It's a, it's a fantastic tool, not just for learning, but for also actually analyzing, uh, you know, how the world works. So we were able to generate these random test signals, essentially, uh, to imitate what we would expect to see in a real world scenario. 
So then using these, we have a lot of freedom to you know, change different uh, noise ratios, frequencies, things like that, and then we can analyze how that affects our algorithm. So we generate these signals, we uh, actually design an algorithm and we design hardware to analyze these signals, and then we can look at what the outputs of those are. Um, another window that I have here for you is the one up here in the top right. And this is actually a model of a hardware design that we, we did to process sort of the signals that you just saw. So you'll see we'll have waves coming in. We design hardware and an algorithm, um, which then process these signals. And then we can actually you know, feed these binary, this binary data directly into our hardware design and see how it processes it. So you, can, you really get the full spectrum of software to hardware. Um, and then you can you know, apply it in real time. And I'm going to hand off to Justin, who's another engineer that works with us, and he does a lot with the specific hardware so that he can talk more in depth about you know, how we implement these systems and uh, what you can do with all of the resources that we have in the lab. So it's nice to meet you. My name is Justin Dunaway. I have a degree in electrical engineering, a bachelor's from Auburn University. Um, I specialize in embedded systems, specifically FPGA design. Um, if you don't know what an FPGA is, it's a field programmable gate array. Um, so what that allows a designer to do is implement um, any type of circuit they would like to um, onto an FPGA. Um, so the FPGA can be thought of basically as this blank canvas um, that can implement any type of digital circuit. Um, so first off, uh, Connor has talked about the algorithm design in MATLAB and kind of um, how he's went about doing that. Um, so I'm going to talk about the supporting hardware that would be implemented around that algorithm um, because an algorithm by itself is, is worthless. You have to be able to feed data to it. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the hardware and, and how we're capturing these waveforms uh, to feed into um, the algorithm design. Um, so if you look down here, we have an FPGA mounted to a host Linux machine. Uh, so this green board that is vertical um, within the, the computing machine is the FPGA. So that blue board that is attached to it is the analog to digital converter, um, which is an ADC. And Connor has mentioned this previously. We're using this to capture these waveforms um, in the analog domain and bring them into the digital domain. Um, and so to do this, we have to use an ADC to capture these waveforms. Um, so the design that is implemented on the FPGA is shown here to the left. So you can tell there's a lot going on within this design. The algorithm implementation within this design is just one single block. So that lets you know how much work has to go into um, communicating with the peripherals and actually using um, additional hardware that connects to the FPGA. Um, so what we're doing is we're capturing these waveforms on the ADC, we bring them into the digital domain on the FPGA, we perform the algorithm processing um, that is, you know, it starts in MATLAB um, as far as the design process and then it gets implemented on the FPGA within our system and then we capture the output of that algorithm and save it into a shared memory that we can access on our host Linux machine. So what you're seeing on the bottom right here is the capture of waveforms. Um, so with our system, we can select to send the waveforms through the algorithm, or we can just capture the waveforms and view those on the host machine. So that's what you're seeing down here in the bottom right. Those are the, the red waveform and the blue waveform would be two waveforms that are captured simultaneously by the FPGA. Um, and so you may be wondering, well, I've, I've never done any type of FPGA design before. I don't really know how to go about doing anything like that. So I actually teach an FPGA class um, here in the Cal during the summertime. And so that is meant for all of the, the smart interns that we bring into the Cal that have an interest in digital design, FPGAs, or algorithm design, such as what Connor does. Um, so this, this FPGA class is taught um, every summer, and it's a, it's a good introduction into digital design and just using FPGAs if you've never done anything like this before. And then you can take that knowledge and, and continue that forward if it's, if it's something that you're really interested in. 
Hello, my name is Wesley Sherman and I graduated from Arizona State University with a bachelor's in software engineering. I started working here at SMDC as part of the SMART program back in July of 2019 and since then I've worked on many different projects ranging from uh, working with a high performance computer, configuring it, getting it set up for AI, ML tasks, um, getting all the latest libraries, dependencies and stuff like that installed, and then starting to actually work on different AI um, image processing, stuff like that, different projects uh, related to it. And you can kind of see some of that work in the background a little bit, some examples that I threw up. And then another one of the big areas that I've been working with has been the Payload Demonstration Lab. And the Payload Demonstration Lab works to provide a in-house ground segment for our small SAT portfolio. Um, we basically build ground stations uh, to handle the ground segment, ground side, all the radio processing, data processing, and um, get everything to actually communicate with the satellite for tasking, command and control, uh, handling payloads, stuff like that. It's been a ton of fun. Um, a lot of that has been kind of working from the ground up, so I've had the opportunity to actually build ground stations from scratch, uh, assist with putting the 3.7 meter antenna systems together, and have had a lot of say in um, some of the architecture and the way that we kind of go about con ops. So that has been a ton of fun. Um, really, really enjoyed the experience. And if you're interested in stuff like that, feel free to come talk to me. Um, we can definitely use as much help as we can get with that. And it's a ton of fun. So that's it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Johnson. I'm an electrical engineer. I studied at Utah State University where I completed my uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree with an emphasis in digital signal processing. Since being here at the command, I've had the opportunity to support multiple radar projects and programs, as well as uh, to work with the Position Navigation and Tracking Resiliency Laboratory, and also developing a test bench for software-defined radios. And I'm Ann Wolf. Um, I graduated from the University of Alabama in Huntsville with my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. I will start my master's degree with electrical engineering in electrical engineering um, this fall. Um, and since starting to work here at the command, I've worked on a lot of radar projects alongside Kevin and some other people. Um, I've recently started on a laser project, which I'm really excited about. Um, and I also split my time working in a targets group that develops targets for missile interceptors. And uh, that's pretty much all I've done here so far. Um, and today we're going to tell you guys about uh, an RF research project that we're working on here in the Cal. Um, the name of the project is called Project Spectre. It supports, our research supports a bigger project. Um, and our research goal is to understand how well multiple transmit antennas can cohere on transmit in the near field and how well that will hold as it transitions into the far field. And that's important because when you have multiple transmit antennas, the, I don't know if you've taken any antennas courses, but the wider across they are, the farther that far field distance gets pushed out, and sometimes even out into space. So we need to know how to cohere in the near field first. Um, so that's one of the biggest goals of this research. And Kevin's going to tell you a little bit about our approach. Yeah, so first off, we went to the fundamental theories uh, to make sure we understood how the waves cohere, the how their electromagnetic waves propagate, what some of the losses are we need to consider, how the antennas impact the, the setup, and uh, basically the fundamental theory. One of the great things about working here is we have access to uh, experts in radar and electromagnetics physics. So Dr. Kirkland, as well as Russ Vela, have been very helpful um, with this whole project. So we've been able to go to them to make sure we understand everything correctly. And they have also helped us with developing the simulations to model in MATLAB what we expect to see in the near field and, and in the far field, and um, how the phase offsets of each antenna will impact the received signal. Uh, we've also, we also have really good access to software here, including MATLAB, the licenses that we need with MATLAB, and other software uh, so that we can do those simulations. 
So, and we'll talk with you about the implementation and how we did uh, at the actual project. So after we simulated it, we kind of knew what to expect, so then we um, began setting up a real experiment. Um, we have access in the CAL to 3D printers. We were actually able to 3D print several antennas um, when we were trying to decide what sort of beam pattern we want, and this was really good. It was a great learning experience for all of us, so we just printed the base layer and then used some metal tape or we printed the, ba brace, the base layer <laughs> and um, used some copper wire. Um, after that, we then went over to the aerophysics lab and we have access to an anticoat chamber there. Um, and there's machinists there that are more than grateful and happy to help us assemble all that we needed. Um, we built up the anticoat chamber uh, the way we needed it. We have um, rail systems and we are able to move our transmit antennas and our receive antennas just the way we want so that we can model each set of each scenario. So. Oh, yeah. and we also have access to tons of RF equipment too, and Kevin can tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, so we wanted to just show off some of our equipment here in the Cal. Um, we recently purchased an arbitrary waveform generator, generator and also a high-end oscilloscope. So over here on the right is the arbitrary waveform generator. This allows us to create any conceivable signal in MATLAB or waveform in MATLAB um, as long as it's within the sample rate, which is up to 15 or 16 gigahertz. And then we can port that into the generator and broadcast, uh, broadcast that signal. On the left is uh, a screen showing the results on our oscilloscope. So right now we're just uh, running the signal right into the oscilloscope so that you can see uh, how this works or so that you can just see what they look like. Um, way over on the left is our arbitrary waveform generator on the top and the oscilloscope that goes up to 23 gigahertz on the bottom. So these tools are really instrumental in the work that we're doing to support program Spectre. And there are many other tools like these here at the Cal. So after we completed the um, experiment in the chamber and collected the data, there was a lot of uh, post-processing and analysis to be done on that data so that we could find out what the discrepancies were between the collected data and what we had simulated. And it was really helpful for me to see how small, small changes in the chamber or in the geometry of our setup um, have a big impact on the results and also what things don't matter as much, um, like the power levels um, and varying those and, and the effects of that. And uh, once we had done the post-processing, we were very pleased after a couple of iterations to uh, pretty much match our simulated data. And this, is, this was basically an initial step to future work that we will be doing. So we've actually started writing a, a, a technical paper um, and right now, the purpose of the technical paper is just to document everything that we've done, um, put all the code that we have in there, we'll document our results, um, so that way it, it's available to anyone in the command, so that way there's no redundant research. They can take what we've done and learn from it and move, go forward with it. Um, but something that the CAL is really good about pushing is publishing papers. So that's kind of the long-term goal of this paper, is once it's been kind of neatened up and completed, we'll hopefully eventually publish. And, the cow is really encouraging of that because it's it's great for your own understanding, it's great for your resume, it's just a great thing. So. Yeah, and that information can be shared within the DOD. And then the unclassified parts or the unsensitive parts can also be shared outside. Moving forward with this project, we will uh, basically move our project outside and we actually have some large dish antennas for like satellite communication that we recently acquired and we can repeat this project up in uh, higher frequencies like X-band, for example, on these dish antennas and find out can we cohere the signal um, a couple miles away here, here on the base. Or maybe we can cohere the signal on some object way farther out, uh, maybe all the way up in space. So th that's the type of thing that we'll be doing here in the future. Um, another thing that Cal has done for this project and for us is they uh, we had one of the radar SMEs that has created and is presenting a radar short course, and this is during the work hours, um, and it's for our own benefit. It's so that we can understand radar better as we're doing this project, um, and that's another thing that Cal is really encouraging of, is learning as we go and talking to all the subject matter experts and communicating with them and just growing. So. 
Hello, my name is Anthony Eubanks. I graduated from the University of Central Florida with my bachelor's in electrical engineering in fall of 2019. My primary focus is on radar and lasers. I'm Kevin. Uh, you met me previously. So Anthony and I are going to uh, just share our experience working with the Position, Navigation, and Tracking Resiliency Lab here uh, within the command. So it's a laboratory here at SMDC that focuses on um, researching and implementing ways to better secure the military assets against positioning and um, navigation attacks. So like GPS signals um, and that sort of thing. So this laboratory had a system they wanted to test out and um, they, were, they had planned to test it out and needed a way to um, capture data during the test. And that's where the Concepts Analysis Lab came in. We offered to help them out with designing the, the um, designing a payload that would capture the desired data. Um, this was a really fun project uh, because we were able to go from start to finish within about six months. So I got to uh, be involved with all the initial decision making as far as what would, what needed to go into the design and why, and uh, the final uh, requirements all the way um, to actually seeing the hardware fly and uh, being able to see something that we had designed uh, here in the Concepts Analysis Lab. Uh, a lot of my work was selecting commercial off-the-shelf components to be used and then integrating those, also writing the uh, software using the C programming language um, on ARM processors, and I even got to learn Python uh, with the help of some of the engineers here and of course Google uh, so that I could do post-processing of the data that we were interested in. Uh, we pulled everything together, we soldered it, we um, created mounts and, uh, and Anthony came in uh, basically just in time to help us to pull everything together and do the testing. I'll let him share um, his experience. So during the summer I had my internship with the Cal and uh, I was able to work on several different projects. One of the projects was what Kevin was mentioning. Um, I came in to the project a little late near the end of it so most of my contribution had to do with kind of wrapping things up and doing some finalizations. We worked closely with Olivia uh, who developed the the mounts and the uh, housing and we made some modifications to that to implement a OLED screen to, way, to where we could uh, view the data real time. We also had some hardware issues that we had to troubleshoot. Uh, we had a blown diode on one of the boards that took a little while to find, but once we were able to find that, we could remove it and replace it. And then we also did a, a little testing here at the Cal before doing the final testing. So again, this was uh, just a really fun project to be a part of because of the, the breadth of what we got to be involved in. Um, I really enjoyed the fact that I got to actually fly out and be a part of the testing experience supporting, um, uh, working with the payload, capturing the data, doing analysis right there on site, um, supporting the team and all their efforts to run the system that was being tested. Um, and then afterward there was plenty of uh, post-processing to do as well uh, and, and that was really rewarding. Um, the command a couple months later actually sponsored me to go to a global navigation satellite system conference, an international conference on uh, basically GPS and GNSS systems and the technology that's out there. Um, I was able to learn about some of the vulnerabilities that we need to be aware of as well as uh, research that's being done to overcome that. So that was really valuable to me and a lot of fun. Now that I've graduated and I'm full time, I've started working on several different projects, two of which are related to Project Spectre. So the two that are related to Spectre are a antenna positioner and a rail system. The antenna positioner is a radar system that we were able to control to um, use with Project Spectre and X-band radar. Um, and the rail system is a system designed to control multiple antenna positions independent of each other. In addition to Project Spectre, I'm also working on a project called Project Exhibitor with uh, Anne and Olivia. This project is uh, designed to kind of look at different uses for laser defense systems when not being used as such. In addition to that, I'm also working on a project with Pete. We are looking at PTS2 radar data collected from CRAM tests 
and we're analyzing that data to see if we can better discriminate UAS targets. And lastly, I'm going to be starting a laser project. Um, this project is designed to develop a three kilowatt laser and a LabVIEW controller and a water chiller for the laser system. So I'm not too familiar with lasers, but I have a high interest in them. And one good thing about working at the Cal is if you have an interest in something, you're able to explore those uh, interests. Hi, my name is Molly Riebling. Um, I graduated from Georgia Tech with a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering, and I came to the Cal through the SMART program. I'm gonna be talking today about our small satellite simulation capabilities. The first thing I'll be talking about is STK, or Systems Toolkit. STK is a software package developed by Analytical Graphics Inc., AGI, and we use it a lot with small satellite simulation. It allows you to uh, input different vehicles, like a satellite, a ground vehicle, an aircraft, and even put sensors and radar on them to do like coverage analysis and everything. We do it a lot, we use it a lot to do coverage analysis, specifically things like SAR, um, even just imaging, uh, and it lets you see in real time where your satellite will be and where your satellite will be able to see. So currently I'm working on the SPECTRE project, which you guys have, I think, already heard about. Um, and the SPECTRE project, we are able to model the biostatic radar in this and make that scenario and then simulate the uh, transmitter bouncing off the in-space reflector and then receiving on the ground and calculate the SNR values from that to do some uh, estimation and optimization. So next we're going to go to the clean room where I'll continue talking about the small satellite simulation capabilities. So welcome to our clean room. Uh, I'll be talking first about our REST system. So REST stands for the Reliable Expandable Satellite Test Bed and REST is, is used for small satellite simulation with hardware and software in the loop sims. And so basically that means that we're able to actually test real small sat hardware in almost like a flat sat configuration sometimes with the machine and it'll actually simulate as if it's on orbit rather than your usual just day in the life testing where it's just sitting on a bench and thinks it's sitting on a bench, so it actually thinks that it's in space. And it's really configurable where we're able to put in different components and also simulate different components. So it's the rigorous testing that you normally don't get with small satellites. So here we are in the other side of the clean room. I'm gonna be talking about our Kestrel Live flat sat. So flat sat configuration is just basically all the satellite components laid out and connected for easier testing before you integrate it into your final satellite bus. So we are able to get the KE flat sat from the Kestrel I satellite that Maryland Aerospace made for us. So Kestrel I was a satellite that actually went up in 2017 and was on orbit and operational and it was mission success and we were able to then communicate with it and so I worked on the ground station of KE when it was on orbit and now I get to work on the flat sat configuration just as a test vehicle for some of the upstairs work. Hi, I'm Gage today. This is Olivia Miller. Today we're in the Concepts Analysis Hardware Lab here at SMDC. A couple things about me. I actually graduated with my degree in computer science at UAH. I'm currently working towards my master's in cybersecurity. Some of the roles that I actually play here in the lab and, and what you'll see today, anything related to rapid prototyping or design or animation is something that I usually have my hand in. Uh, I also carry some of the roles in cybersecurity related to my master's background. Uh, Olivia, if you want to tell them a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, so I graduated from the University of Alabama with both my bachelor's and my master's degree in mechanical engineering. And since I've been in the concepts analysis lab, I've worked with Gage on any prototyping problem that we have in the Cal any project that re requires any kind of special design, that's what we've been working on. Just to give a brief overview of some of the ways we use the machines that Walter had mentioned earlier in the video, this lab has a high focus on rapid prototyping and additive manufacturing. And for us, that means lots of designing is going on, and sometimes we need to do those rapidly, sometimes we need to see the end result or be able to test the end result a little earlier. That way we can kind of iterate and change things. So we're able to do that by having all these 3D printers. This is one of our newest ones. This is the F370. This printer alone can do seven different plastic types. Uh, it can do a rubber material. It can do multiple types of your standard plastics that you would find on a consumer grade printer. Uh, it can also do a high temperature plastic. So this just gives the engineer uh, a versatility in what they use and what their end game is. 
We also have multiple other printers that can do more different plastic types. We also carry all your consumer grade printers, so your Prusa and your MakerBot. So for those quick jobs that you really don't need something so big, you can just load it up, put your print on there, and you're, you're pretty quickly done. Uh, we also have a PCB mill, so if you're interested in designing your own circuit boards and being able to cut those, we can do that here in the lab. Pretty much anything you can think of, design oriented, and being able to kind of do it by hand, you can do that here. Uh, there's been various projects where we've been able to leverage our printers. Uh, we had an antenna a while back called Walt Antenna and it had some arrays on it. And we inspect those arrays out uh, and we looked at what it was going to cost us and they, they were in the thousands. So we said, why don't we try and do that ourselves? So that's exactly what we did. In the end, after a couple months of iteration, we were able to print these for $6 a unit. One of the other biggest achievements that have come out of this lab in regards to our in-house manufacturing is ACES Red. So you'll hear a little bit more about ACES Red from Olivia and maybe some of the other groups, but one of the great things that we did was pretty much all of it was manufactured here. Uh, even the, the actual chassis was manufactured at the Aerophysics Lab. But to go along with that, we were able to apply for a patent based on the modular system that we created. So the tray and the slot system that you'll see, uh, that actually has a patent applied for. So we're really excited about that. That's, that's something uh, we cheer for here in the lab. So if you can kind of you know, design something that maybe one day you can patent, you absolutely can do that here. Now Olivia is going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the other projects that we've been able to, to use these machines for here in the lab. Alright, so one thing that we can do, do using all these printers is create scale models. Um, here are some examples of scale models. These are really useful in meetings um, to use as visual representation for systems that people might have not otherwise seen before. Um, an example of this is this hypersonics model. Gage drew this in SolidWorks and printed it up piece by piece. Um, on a much larger scale and ended up being a three-foot model and took it for demonstration at the Pentagon. So that is one great application of our 3D printers. Um, also, as Gage mentioned earlier, we um, a few years ago worked on a satellite project called ACES RED, and in this project we were mounting a satellite body to the ISS. Um, so with this project we designed everything um, from the electrical system to the structure system. Um, that was all done in-house, so we designed that in SOLIDWORKS, and since we were designing that structure all ourselves, we were working very closely with the electrical side of the project. So in that pro project specifically, it was great to have the 3D printing capabilities, so whenever we were designing the different trays that their boards were going to be placed on, we could print off specific elements and hand that off to them so that they knew how much space they had to work with. Um, so in that project, you know, we were working, and um, once we finally got it revised down to our final re revision, we got our drawing package complete, made that all in SOLIDWORKS, and with that drawing package went over to our aerophysics lab facility where we have a full machine shop and we're able to fabricate the exact machine um, out of aluminum. So here you see the entire system 3D printed and right next to the aluminum frame system. So another way that we're able to help the CAL with um, our prototyping capabilities is designing specific components that assist in CAL experiments. Last summer I had the opportunity to work on a project where a CAL engineer had designed a data logger about this big that needed to be flown alongside a drone during flight, but it did not need to affect the flight performance of the drone or else the data wouldn't be correct. Um, so I took the data logger, took some measurements, reverse engineered it and drew it up in SOLIDWORKS. And using that drawing, I was able to design a little enclosure around it, um, ensuring that all the openings um, that they needed to access during the experiments were available. Um, and having the rapid prototyping capabilities, you know, if we saw something wasn't lining up correctly, we could just go quickly fix it, print it again, and check it again. Um, after we were happy with the enclosure design, we added on the legs that would attach to the drone itself. And once we were happy with that total design, went out, tested it, and it worked and they had a successful test. So one thing that we noticed during this project, um, whenever we started out this project, we did not have a high fidelity CAD model of the drone that we were trying to design with. Um, 
Further on in the project, we did find that CAD model, but it alerted us to a need that we had in the cow. What if we, in the future, have a project that we need to design around that we can't just find the CAD file for? Um, so that resulted in our newest asset to our prototyping capabilities, which is this handheld 3D scanner. And the way that this works is you're able to scan objects, and as you're scanning, it collects points in space and eventually creates you know, your high fidelity CAD model. So in the future, that's going to assist us in creating scale models as well as design projects similar to the drone mount project. Hi, my name is Henry Stewart. I am the lab tech slash engineering technician down here in the concepts analysis lab. Uh, I'm pretty much the go-to person. I keep everything operational and functional. Uh, I mentor the uh, new incoming uh, engineers on how to debug and troubleshoot printed circuit boards. Um, <clears throat> can't wait to see you and I wish you luck. Thank you. Hello, I'm Pete Kirkland. Uh, I'm well, one of the original founders of the Concepts Analysis Lab and am now employed by PeopleTech as a, as a contractor and a, basically a technical advisor to the Cal Lab. I am, my major job is to define new concepts or, te or technologies and projects for the young engineers here and to mentor them during the execution of those projects. A little history of the, of the Concepts Analysis Lab. In 2003, I was a government employee uh, working as technical advisor to the director of the technical center and he came to me and asked me, what can we do to improve our technical capability? And we came up with this concept of a collaborative environment where we bring all the young engineers in. They will work together as a period of time on technologies and testing of technologies uh, and then eventually they would be trained and in approximately two years they would move out into those taking those technologies and projects with them into the other parts of the tech center. In 2004 we actually brought it together and had our first group in fact it was almost exactly 16 years ago it was May of 2004 we had our first group of seven young engineers and scientists in the Cal and from that point on it has continued, it has grown and it has been a great thing. It's a great environment to work in and we're looking forward to getting you guys up here to working with us. Hi, my name is Sarah Ross. I'm a UAH contractor supporting the Cal as a research coordinator. Some of my primary roles is to assist you with in processing, training, coordinating your hardware and software needs, helping you stay connected and informed. I'm here to help you, just let me know what you need, and we're looking forward to meeting you in person. Hi, I'm Patricia Falco, and I am a program and management analyst assigned to the CAL. My main focus is budget execution, which is why I will be guiding and assisting you in any transaction that involves the CAL's budget, whether it be credit card purchases, for supplies, or training classes, or even contract support. One of my main responsibilities is to ensure that we properly execute our assigned funding and that we follow the Army's rules and regulations on audit readiness guidelines. These actions keep us legal and they keep us out of trouble. And that's exactly where we want to be with all of our financial transactions. I look forward to meeting you in person. Be safe. Hi, my name is Tina McGee. I am a part-time contractor supporting the Cal. I work for PeopleTech Incorporated. I recently retired uh, back in June of 2019 from the 34 years of Army service and then I came back as a part-time contractor. I do budget support. Uh, I assist Andrea with um, our contract, monitoring our contracts and I will assist you in any of your projects that you may have when it comes to budget development or putting money on contracts. So I hope you enjoyed what you saw today. Um, now's a good time for you to prepare questions that you might have for our team members and about the Smart Scholarship in general. And I really look forward to seeing you in our upcoming team session.